again, it's Paul Feuerstein with a big sigh, still here in my room, locked up. And luckily, I have access to people who I know, who are friends, and Jerry Kugel, Dr. Jerry Kugel. How are you this morning? Good, Paul. Thank you for having me. Uh, Jerry is, the, is an associate dean at uh, Tufts University. Uh, and I want to talk, we'll be talking to him a little bit at dental school right now. He's a world-class restorative dentist, and I can tell you that from firsthand experience. I've seen some beautiful things that he's done for patients and, and mutual patients. Mm -hmm. And a fantastic lecturer, a good friend. We don't live too far from each other, but we never see each other in Boston. We see each other in San Francisco and, oh, and wherever it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's not happening right now. For I don't know what's going to happen with dental meetings, to be honest with you, Jerry. That's wow. As far as that's concerned. And for you and I, who are so used to getting on planes and traveling, uh, this has been very strange. It's, 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 it's a big strain. So uh, I, I just have to tell an anecdote is that, uh, you know, we, we know each other and we know each other's uh, skill set and knowledge base. And Jerry was giving a lecture somewhere. I forgot where it was. And I just walked into the back of the room to wave. He goes, Paul, I got a question for you. Tell the class about A, B, and C. And while you're here, I need something from the Can you run upstairs and grab the thing from this upstairs and bring it down to the, I bring it down the room? Uh, <laughs> bring it down uh, the room for me. Uh, we've, been, so, we've been around so, for a long time, Paul. Oh yeah, it's been a while. So, so really, I, I have a real question about dental school. You know, we know about kids' schools. The dental school must be in shambles of some sort. Uh, what, what, what's, what's happening with the school itself? A sure. couple of questions and the clinic. And what about my graduating seniors? So let's let's take them all in a row here. <laughs> uh, well, let's start. I guess we'll start with the school. The school closed down to give Nadine Karenbach, our dean, credit. The dean with the council of, you know, we have deans, we have our deans and chairs meeting. Matter of fact, at noon, we have that happening today. Um, he made the decision just prior to the state really shutting everything down that we were going to close down. Now, that is a huge undertaking. I mean, I, I also am involved in practice. I own a practice in Boston. So we've got, I guess we have eight docs now in the office. I mean, that's a big deal. Trust me. But I'm only there a day and a half, two days a week, really day and a half. And so for me, that's not as big a deal, but shutting down a dental school, I mean, you remember your senior year of dental school and the stress you were under to graduate. Um, I'm sure you were done a year early, but the average student. Half a year, half a year. Half a year early, yeah. Uh, but there are a lot of students, you know, even the ones that are done, that are just holding on a couple of cases to close up, they're out. So now the question is, how do you graduate them? Uh, can you get them back in the building? We still don't know our update, our start date. We're looking now at probably mid-May, but I'm not sure what's going to happen. We have the students who are not in clinic, so we've got the first years, they're easier to deal with. So I've been lecturing to them. So they've gotten, I've gotten good at Zoom lectures. I have one tomorrow on glass ionomers. Um, Dr. Eisen has been working with me. So all the faculty are doing online lectures. Um, that's a big deal. And you and I joked earlier, it's a very different experience to be on a room, and you've done webinars, um, having students on a computer screen, not looking at their responses, not looking at who's paying attention, a different experience. So we've got the education component, the clinical component. Uh, the seniors now, we're looking at ways to modify their requirements, but we still have to meet CODA requirements. They've got to meet yeah. certain uh, requirements. A lot of them have passed the boards, and we've got a number of seniors who've passed their licensing boards, but still have requirements. So the question is m a couple of things. Maybe they need to deliver a, a crown, or they've got, a, I don't know, a, a denture to deliver. The question is, since they've got their boards, since they've done well in school and they're missing a requirement, do we allow them to graduate? Do we bring them back? So right now, the plan is if we can, and this is just my school and I'm speaking for me, not the dental school. Uh, the plan is to get them back in May, only the seniors to finish up what they need to finish up, keep the other students out of the building for now. Um, I could go on and on without you asking another question because there's other issues here. Now, let's say we get back into the building Mm -hmm. Let's say the seniors get back into the building. Do we test all of the seniors? Don't forget, dental students don't just come from Boston and, and Massachusetts. We got so, it in New York. You have, now you have international students. Of course, I mean. yeah. <laughs> and, and they want to come back. Now, do we quarantine somebody in a hot spot like New York City? Do we bring them back and test them? We plan on trying to test everybody. Wow. Not easy to do. Um, patients coming in will have their temperatures taken. At least this is what I think at this point. Um, I think if we could test everybody, that would be great. Uh, getting them on elevators, think about this. We have, you know, we're a 15 story building with four and assumed to be five elevators, but right now four elevators. How do you social distance? Wow. Get marks on the floor, have them separated into two or four people. 
maybe put on the elevator a stand that's got tissues and wipes for them to wipe the buttons. I mean, Gosh, the it's logistics. a little crazy. Op open chairs, you know, you know how it was in dental school. Most yeah. of them were not in a single room, so there's open access. You have a wall, you know, four feet, five feet high. Um, do you then separate them so you have a patient every other chair? Probably we're going to have to do that. Um, it's a nightmare when you don't have those kind of requirements. So we're a busy clinic. Now you throw that in. And, and last but not least, what you think about in practice. I think in practice, it'll be different. You and I have patients that have been with me 35 or more years. They'll come back. Uh, yeah. They're not going to be, I, th I think they'll come back. You take a dental school patient, Paul, well, you're not sick, are you? No. <laughs> Realize if you sneeze or cough nowadays. You know, <laughs> yeah, I'll people, tell you what. Here we go. I'm, I'm going to leave the room. There we go. I feel better now. <laughs> Get out, will you? <laughs> so, um, you know, it's it's uh, it's a challenge in any situation. In private practice, I was saying people are more willing to come back. Will patients come back to the dental school readily, or will they be hesitant, given the fact they have to come into the city, go into a large building, get on an elevator? Uh, staggered start times in the morning, maybe three start times, stagger the chairs, only have the seniors back. The third years are panicked because if you're a third year dental student, you're in the clinic, you're just getting started. Now you're sitting, waiting to get back in. Now every day you sit there, you've lost the requirement. Wow. You haven't gotten that restoration done. So uh, the dental schools all over the country, but particularly in those states that are remaining closed, it's tough. It's tough on the students, the faculty, the boards. Uh, now, also think about this. Let's go to the next level. You're paying your pay, your staff, or you've laid staff off, whatever you've decided to do. At the dental schools and the universities, they're paying salaries to the faculty. Sure. So they're bringing 30% of their income or more comes from clinic income. You're not generating clinic income. Um, you've had to compensate those kids who lived in dorms because they left. Um, there's that huge expense. So what happens after everything opens? you're going to be in a deficit. You still aren't going to see the clinic income that you were seeing. You're not getting the support. We're not getting the big bucks. And I'm not saying you are, but private practices at least can apply for the loans. Uh, we can. Well, even, even when the clinic reopens, it's going to be a much smaller schedule. You're not going to be packed with a waiting room full of people. Exactly. So I mean, you, you, diminished, you, certainly diminished. You, you can't. So all of these are things that literally we talk about a couple of days a week. And as a matter of fact, today at noontime, um, there'll be a long conversation about our next steps. The ramp up is a big deal. The boards, you know, what happens to those kids that are waiting to get their license? I think it was, I just read, what state was it? Um, oh God, I'm blanking out. Was it Maine? Somebody just, uh, is they're granting licensure to the kids who've got, who've adequately fulfilled their dental school requirement. It's, wow. it's, it's tough, Paul. I mean, it's tough. I, um, I'm jumping around a little bit, but um, yeah, no, no, no. I mean, this is this is this is what we want to hear. I mean, <clears throat> I'm thinking of my senior year. You're looking to finish up that last denture, and you want to, you know, wait to go get your cap and gown. And then I'm a doctor now, and but you had a list. At least when I was in school, we had a very specific list of requirements. There's so many, so many gold foils. You know, <laughs> gold foils. We do a lot of those now, Paul, don't we? <laughs> um, a quick question on the on the educational side. So you're doing webinars, but is there any is there any way that there can be a virtual hands-on of any sort? Is there any way to do that? That's the billion dollar question. Right now we're not doing that. And I'll tell you the benefit. I, I run the, with Dr. Eisen, we run the first year operative course, two days a week, two and a half days, uh, which is their most contact time in dental school first year. Uh, they had already done five of their six practical exams. Uh -huh. They only had one left to go. So we eliminated that sixth exam. So they've done five practicals. They haven't finished their didactic. They've had two written exams. So in a way, the timing wasn't terrible for us. So we've been giving them lectures. We can't really do the virtual hands-on. So, um, I mean, there are ways you could theoretically do it uh, for a small group. I think of 205 or 204 kids. How do you do yeah. virtual hands-on? Yeah. Here's another thing, but by the way, Paul, to think about now. So let's say we open up in the middle of May or June 1st, whatever it ends up being. Do you bring back 204 kids and put them in one room? <laughs> No. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've lectured upstairs in the, in the big in the yeah. big lecture rooms, and, and it's, it's, I mean, it's probably two feet apart from each people. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. you've lectured many times you, at the school, you know what I'm talking about. So we have to then stagger for the faculty, come up with a way to stagger the teaching, to break them into groups of, of maybe, you know, 50 kids. Wow. Um, and then put them in different areas. It's not going to be easy if you're teaching a course like that. Think okay. about the added, uh, the added workload on you 
to do that. So whoever's running a course, or he or she's gonna have to figure out how to, to deal with staggering. Now, my, the class I teach, and a lot of them are that size, 200 kids. Um, we do have a simulation clinic upstairs. We have the eighth floor. Yeah. You've seen that. So we could yeah. split them that way, but we still have to stagger them because they're too close together. You're right. In the sim clinic, there's 100 chairs, but unfortunately, those chairs are probably three or four feet apart, maybe. So, so this, this is going to be a generational issue. I mean, it's not just the seniors. It's going to be every. every it's going to be a, a sort of a domino effect up up the road here. And you may even, I mean, I'm wondering if you're going to have to extend hours and uh, of the day when you get back rolling and, and things like that. I mean, I don't Saturday know. and maybe Saturday, Sunday, yeah. opening up certain clinics. I mean, um, and, and then some of the students need money. They have to, you know, they have these part time jobs and things like that. They go, hey, what, what are we going to do? Well, I mean, it's, I assume there's assistance at some point, but that up to a point, it's not going to help, really. I agree. I mean, so we're, yeah, and, and you know, it's going to change education in general, this whole experience. And even the Zoom learning, I mean, what we may have to do is do all our lectures virtually and then reserve the clinic, the hands on time, sure. or the class yeah. for only hands on, and then split them. Because normally you come into a class at one o'clock, there'll be a, a one to two lecture, maybe one to two thirty. Then from two thirty to four, you're doing hands on. What we may have to do is virtual lectures, split them into groups get them into the clinic. And so eliminate lectures, do them all virtually. I, I don't know how that'll work out. I mean, you can obviously do it. Um, what the experience is for a student getting virtual lectures versus in classroom lectures where you're walking around talking. I'm a very interactive lecturer like you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get people involved. I walk around, I ask students questions. You can do that on Zoom at some level, but it's not the same. Boy, gee, I, I... And, and I'm a little worried. I mean, there has to be, I mean, I assume that there are requirements to be a dentist from a, it's sort of a, a national thing. Right. And you have to re meet the requirements. So even if you're saying, well, get these students out, can you? Is, is it even, are they going to have valid licenses? Or is it a little, a little asterisk, like a Roger Maris asterisk? Yeah, right. well, it's funny. It's funny. I was on the phone with one of the, uh, the board, the CODA people yesterday for a different reason. Yeah. And he's heavily involved. Uh, he said they've been meeting for hours and hours, you know, two and three hour meetings, a couple of days a week, trying to figure out how they're going to make this work so that you get a kid that's competent. When I say kid, not belittling them, but a student that's competent um, and has filled the requirements because you're saying to the general population, they're ready to see patients. Um, and then the other issue that we could talk about for days, I'm sure you've talked to other people, then when they get out, what's waiting for them outside? I mean, yeah. it's going to be a different world. I mean, I talked to older dentists. I mean, you and I are fortunately far enough along that if we don't work, we'll be okay. But there are some dentists that are looking at their practices, and I already had two things yesterday about practices for sale. Um, uh, DSOs are going to come in and I think potentially scoop a lot of those up. So the students have debt. They're coming out of school with an environment that's going to be very different. Yeah. Income, the dental practices are looking at a lot of lost income. They're not going to be running around grabbing associates right away to come in. Well, um, well, we have to catch up with, with, with the work that we've lost over this time. So, I mean, it's a 50-50, but I can't promise millions of dollars to some young yeah, student. Yeah. yeah, here we go. We'll, we'll give you whatever you want. I agree. Now, we don't know. You, know. you and I may be surprised. We may open our doors in June or, or May and have them lined up on the street. I'm not really sure what's going to happen when I open the door. I, I think we'll be okay. I think we'll yeah. actually be busy. Uh, I've got a lot of cases literally sitting on a shelf in my practice. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, well, everybody, everybody's listening has, has people in temps all over the place and uh, waiting, you know, finishing those things, not to mention what's going on and patients that have non-emergency, you know, I can wait, I can wait, but all of a sudden you're going to go in and say, Oh my God, I have, you know, 30 patients I have to see the next uh, couple of days that cement all the crowns back in. And the, I agree. I think it's going to be, I think you see a number of emergencies that have been sitting saying, I want Dr. Furstein, I want Dr. Kugel to be back. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be an interesting time for us, for young dentists, the future. I mean, it'll be okay. Don't get yeah, me wrong, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but it's going to be different. And, yeah. and it's, and they're coming into our practices. So what's different is how we're not used to this either. I mean, this whole thing, this is new to all of us. I mean, I can't help, I can't mentor them. Like I, I mean, I can mentor them, but not the way I could because right. this is a new experience for me as well. Right. This is crazy, Jerry. Well, I, I wish you had more time, but um, I mean, you really, Shock! I think you'll, this is going to be a shocking. We'll call this the shocking video of, of reality here of dental school. And everybody, every dentist who's gone to school is sitting there going, "Oh my God! It, it's you know you don't even think about this, and you're giving us the real nuts and bolts here." I so, mean, uh, 
a simple thing like getting up to the clinic. I mean, you, you, you start thinking about all of this and it becomes a little mind boggling. That's why we're spending so much time as a group. I'm, I have been busy while we've been shut down because oh, yeah. I'm on, I'm on, you know, zoom lectures, uh, web meetings, uh, research council meetings. I mean, I could go into all the about research being shut down at universities and federal money paying for that research and technicians sitting waiting to get back. And is my job secure at a university and my salary going to be cut? I mean, it's, it's tough. That's crazy. It's, it, it, let's pray that it gets better. Look, I want to believe like everybody does. And I think it will get better, obviously, when I don't know. Yeah, I think when we get, when we get out there, we're going to put our hands in the water. And if it's not too cold, we'll go in a little deeper, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, Jerry, really, it's been, it's been quite a pleasure talking to you this morning. We ran over time, which is fine with me. There's a lot to talk about, a lot to think about. And really, thanks. And stay safe in Boston. And uh, you know, see if you can find some good uh, good food out at the North End. If anybody's still <laughs> yeah, they are. They're doing takeout. I've been I've been good. And I've got a wife who can cook. And that's going to be a bad thing. Uh, only tell me from here up. I don't want you to see the rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me about it. <laughs> All right, Jerry. Thanks All so right. much. Thanks again. Take care. Thanks, Take everybody. Care. Bye, bye.